Okay, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining in at our webinar this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, we will be talking about how AI, IoT, big data, and other technologies plays an important role in disaster prevention. And to make this event happening, uh, we have lots of people to thank. Uh, so if you bear with me, I would like to sincerely thank the following organizations. So firstly, it's definitely our Industry Development Bureau of the Ministry of Economic Affairs here in Taiwan, and also Manila Economic and Cultural Office, Philippine Trade and Investment Center in Taipei, QBO Innovation Hub, Innovex, of course, and Startup Islands Taiwan. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to build a firm bridge uh, for startups, for investors, and for companies across industries and also ICT companies. And hopefully we can stimulate different business opportunities in the future. To kick off our webinar this afternoon, it is with great pleasure to invite Mr. Michael Alfred Ignacio, who is the representative of the Department of Trade and Industry Trade, and as well as Manila Economic and Cultural Office Director for Commercial Affairs. Director Michael, if you'd be so kind to come on to the stage here and for your opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. Um, thank you, Sakura and David, and your wonderful team here at the Taipei Computer Association. Um, I am Michael Alfred Ignacio. I head the Philippine Trade and Investment Center uh, in Taipei, which is the commercial affairs section of Manila Economic and Cultural Office and um, the Philippine Trade and, and the representative office of the Philippine Department of Trade and Industry. Um, when TCA, our friends of TCA, approached us to propose this idea, we immediately grabbed it because I think this is the right time and the right moment. The world is facing um, unprecedented times and, and I think the role of startups and innovation is really to help solve uh, the way and uh, this, this big problem that's created a lot of uh, uncertainty uh, and innovation and technology is such a tool that uh, we can use and today I am very honored to bring to you my uh, Undersecretary uh, Fita Aldaba who is a Deputy Minister at our Department of Trade and Industry and also uh, colleagues from the Philippines, uh, Kat uh, Chan, who is executive director of QBO, and uh, also excellent startups from the Philippines. I would like to acknowledge the excellent um, professors from Taiwan who are also here to talk about disaster uh, prevention and management. And uh, well, I think this will be a great time uh, this afternoon to put together uh, ideas from both sides in the Philippines and Taiwan to help solve problems together. Uh, and we are also opening the floor for partnerships and collaboration. Um, I am also very glad to have Ralph of Senti AI, Earl of VoxP Tech, who works with an amazing team whom I used to work with in the private sector in my past life, and also Emil of MedCheck. And they're amazing startups and are actually leading the technological fight against COVID and helping us deal in a big way with this crisis. So Philippines and Taiwan and the world, thank you very much and good afternoon. Thank you so much, Director Michael. Thank you. I will kindly ask you to return to your seat. Uh, we actually do have a physical uh, uh, studio here in Taipei. Uh, so this is why uh, Michael will be sitting for the remaining of our session. Uh, so thank you so much for your open remarks and we uh, definitely see different uh, collaboration opportunities in the future. Um, so before we move on to our keynotes, uh, I would like to address a couple of housekeeping uh, for our audience online. So uh, if you have any questions that you would like to ask to our speakers, uh, please do so uh, using through the, uh, the text area. Now remember to please address whom the question is for and what the question is. And today we will only be answering questions that is related to our topic. Yes, and also to please turn off your microphones if you'd be so kind. This is to remain a good quality of our webinar. All right, so uh, following will be uh, four keynote speakers and our speaker number one is Dr. Hong Chi Kuo, the Director and Chair Professor for the Center of Weather, Climate and Disaster Research at the National Taiwan University 
and his keynote topic today is on technology development and disaster prevention in Taiwan. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, all the friends in, from Philippines. Uh, I'm a scientist, so now I in charge of the center. So in my presentation, my uh, CEO he will later present some of the details, but I will just focusing on uh, staying that uh, stay. Am I right, uh, Jerry? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Uh, they will send the bot to you there. No, but uh, Jerry, when can you send the bot? Okay, I will kindly oh, ask the uh, audience to please turn off the microphone. Uh, I'll also ask my staff members to please turn off everyone's mic uh, who is not speaking. Thank you. Professor, if you'd be so kind to continue. So I think uh, this time it's really unprecedented. Uh, may I have uh, my PowerPoint uh, back on? Yeah. So I was started, uh, I think, uh, so something, this is not, you, you don't need to pay attention to this. This is some 20 years ago. Well, I worked with my students. We published a very important paper. We just simply saying that the typhoon form every seven and eight days in the place where you have a easterly and a westerly. Now, now this is a, the, the picture of, uh, you can see two arrows. The right arrow is the easterly associated with the high pressure, and the left is a westerly, it's associated with the, uh, uh, the monsoon trough, so-called. So uh, you don't need to really bore into all this detail, just simply from this study, we find out that whenever you have a westerly, the year or the situation, you have more typhoon. And when you have a easterly, you have less typhoon. So the idea of this picture showing, as you see the red line there and the, show the westerly, this is a typical situation in the June. And also this westerly will progress into the east of the Philippines. But uh, this year, surprisingly, the westerly is missing. It's unprecedented. So, so far we have very few typhoons. Oh, we have a typhoon is relatively weak. So it just say that we have COVID-19, we have very drastic climate change, and all this part of associated with it, you can see this picture showing the Yangtze River Basin, and uh, on this uh, diagram, according to the Japan Meteorology Agency, uh, the idea is that the, the top red line shows this year the accumulated rainfall. So again, it's unprecedented. It's never before, even 2016 is extreme, but this year, no typhoon, or typhoon is relatively weak, and uh, COVID-19 and everything. So all this kind of thing is very highly unprecedented. And uh, then I'll just simply point out in Taiwan, big city, in one hour time, you can have a rainfall of 131 millimeter. It becomes more often now in the climate change. So 131 millimeter, that means 100, 131 kilometer, uh, I mean kilogram of weight of water falling down from the sky in one hour. This is tremendous. And this, if it's falling on the city, even in Manila or in Taipei or in any big city, this is a challenge for the disaster mitigation. So in National Taiwan University, I used to be the provost and uh, we are working on Kino, working on this and we, this center, we just want to study. We want to have a weather and the climate expertise to join with the hydrology. And we want to combine these two in the disaster mitigation, but the most important basic line is the information science. This is the, the four places we join together in our center. And then the things I will ask my CEO, he will give us more the things we are doing in our center. Thank you. Uh, so 
So basically, uh, the purpose for our center is establish the cutting edge research, typically in the meteorology, hydrology, and flooding inundation, all kind of uh, research. And typically, we are uh, enhancing the international collaboration. So that's our four division, uh, including the weather climate uh, and the R&D division. And also, we uh, develop a lot of uh, software and deal with the big data. So uh, totally, uh, probably we have uh, more than uh, 80 uh, researchers in our center. <coughs> so basically, we have a uh, purpose. One is uh, cooperate with the central government and also the local government. And in public uh, domains, we cooperate with uh, uh, individual uh, citizens. So uh, for example, last year, <coughs> we provide the information uh, to cooperate with the water resource agency uh, in central government. So we provide the data for before the disaster, during and after. So uh, during the uh, uh, disaster, we have to provide a real-time weather observation analysis. And also we analyze the upcoming weather system. So typically for last year, we provide more than 250 uh, reports uh, to the uh, water resource agency. So for the uh, for emergency response, also for the decision making. <clears throat> so basically we provide and analyze the, the big data to serve, um, uh, to provide the information for decision making and also the staff, typically for the personnel who operate the emergency uh, staffs. <clears throat> so for example, we uh, provide the data display system. So nowadays we just not only use a computer and also use a cell phone. So you can watch the data and the new is the information everywhere. Then other things we also provide the descendant center. So we collect a lot of uh, experiences and uh, for the uh, preparedness. The second thing we uh, cooperate with the local government. <clears throat> One thing is we use a deep learning application uh, for severe weather forecasting, typically for the hydrometeorology domain knowledge. <clears throat> then many uh, software and systems we provide, like uh, for example, we are uh, dealing with the whole system in uh, Dantra River Basin, which is flow through the uh, private city and also the in private city. We also provide inundation uh, information for the local government to serve the uh, preparedness and also the emergency response. <clears throat> and we also have uh, some uh, like a war game system. You know? So we can uh, uh, provide such kind of things for the personnel who not just only the data, only the visualization. So like a three-dimensional weather system and also the inundation in the city area. And nowadays the problem is like uh, uh, we have a lot of recreation area in the uh, river mountain area. So uh, we need to provide more accurate in a small, very tiny uh, watershed. And also we uh, provide the uh, early warning system to the local government. <coughs> then uh, help them to do the disaster prevention drilling and also the training. For example, we uh, train the elder people, you know, most of the time in a, a small tiny community, typically somewhere easy to get flood inundated. So we have trained the local people to learn how to uh, survive during the disaster. Then for example, last year we uh, cooperated with the, okay, uh, with the, uh, the water resource agency, then uh, there's a, a 470 uh, resilient community. In this year, more than 500 we're going to serve and cover with them. Then finally, we provide uh, a lot of data for the uh, uh, person, uh, for the citizen. For example, uh, we provide the data based uh, disaster information for local community. So they can get the information uh, from their cellular phone and easy to get the information. Um, finally, we also uh, contribute in water education, not for like uh, elementary school, high school, also the college level. So many, many uh, uh, conference and we join in and uh, give them the service uh, for this. Okay, uh, this for, thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, professors. Uh, thank you very much. So.
I think through the presentation, we learned that obviously disaster is not only just uh, natural disasters, such as typhoons and uh, tsunamis, but also in, di in different forms, as this year we faced COVID-19 uh, harshly. Um, so I think, thank you so much uh, for, for that presentation. Now, second keynote speaker is Dr. Tianyin Zhou, who is the president of the Chinese Soil and Water Conservation Society. And his presentation is on special information application for disaster prevention and early warning system. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. This is my honor to, uh, to present this topic to you. The topic about the special information application for disaster prevention and early warning systems. Uh, my name is Ken Zhu and I'm the Dean and Professor in the Fengjiang University. Uh, I'm also the President for Chinese Soil and Water Conservation Society and so Chair uh, for Open Geospatial Consortium uh, Asia Forum. And I'm serve as a Secretary General of the Asia Pacific Federation for Information Technology in Agriculture. So uh, I'll start my presentation about uh, Taiwan being suffered by a lot by different kind of natural disaster. One of the very severe thing is the earthquake. This is how many earthquakes we have in, per year. And, and also uh, for typhoons, we have lots of typhoons each year. So every natural disaster causes a lot of uh, damages to the entire country. So in Taiwan, uh, we try uh, very, very hard, try to monitor, try to integrate, try to use the technology of interoperability uh, using the special information, cloud computing, open data, and big data uh, analysis and technology. For example, uh, one of the example is we've been work very close with Southern Water, Water Conservation Bureau in Taiwan, and we put lots of different kinds of sensors along those kind of very high risk, uh, dangerous slope land. So for those sensors, we'll be able to make very uh, good early warning or even monitor any kind of disaster really happening. So all the uh, communications through different kind of satellite or SIM card or some kind of uh, 4G or even now we're trying some, some of the places using the 5G uh, technology, sending the information back to emergency center and also send alert uh, to everyone's cell phone and also uh, can be published to everyone to analyze all the things. So we did develop lots of different kind of technology, include different kind of facility, hardware, uh, such as a mobile vehicle can drive to the certain area and put everything uh, on there or some kind of camera with a, a solar panel and also with some, some of lots of different kind of communication uh, facility. Uh, could you put, yeah, that one. So these are some of the images we can capture directly uh, through those technology, for example, on the uh, most up and, uh, upper images for the uh, left-hand side, that's a geophone information, represent one of geophone being put in very, very upstream. The right-hand side is one of the real debris flow happened in several years ago in central Taiwan. So these kind of disaster, this kind of debris flow or some kind of high risk uh, in a wild, wild creek did happen every year during the typhoon season. So this is something we have to face every day. So in Taiwan, uh, not only the central government, but also the, a lot of local, local uh, government, they all work together with university, with private company, put a lot of different kinds of sensors using the uh, uh, artificial intelligence or the internet of things together, we say AIoT, toward the very smart communities. For example, uh, we can put a lot of different kinds of sensors with good communication uh, technologies to send all the information where has been uh, floods or where has been like a very high risk uh, of the water level or has a very, very uh, severe uh, situation. For example, this is using different kinds of technology to identify uh, where are the floods and also how about the floods depth. So we can use the AI technique. As you can see the image on the right hand side, there's uh, 11. Uh, that means the, the uh, centimeter for the uh, flood depth. So there are several technology being used in this camera. So there are a vision using the uh, red line as a, as a uh, vision line to identify 
the, the flood steps and also use different kind of AI technologies. So when we use this kind of technology, we can combine together with all different kind of information. For example, the rainfall gauge for rainfall intensity. For example, the sewage information for any kind of like inflow or outflow condition and use different kind of model. So we can not only to predict using different kind of model, but also we can have the real time, like, and also we can, we can use this kind of post analysis to get a better uh, simulation or a better pre prediction in the future. So in Taiwan, lots of the city government has, in, has installed this kind of camera and also has AI technology and transfer all the information back directly. And in Taiwan, not only for floods, but also for, for example, uh, this kind of factory uh, disaster for the fire, certain fire. So we can also put lots of these kind of sensors along this kind of very dangerous the gas tank or some kind of petroleum tank. So for those kind of very vulnerable, uh, flammable things, we'll be able to put lots of different kind of sensors. So in Taiwan, there are lots of different kind of research are, are going on. Uh, the city government put this kind of uh, water level identification uh, just using a camera. In the university, the student use a camera to identify where has been the ducks going in the, on the Fengjia University campus. So the, 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 like on the, on the upper central one, uh, this is the image uh, to identify where ducks are going uh, during the campus. Uh, can, we talk, can we go to the next page? Yeah, okay. So in Taiwan, lots of this kind of uh, municipal government they all have used a very good GIS technology to represent or to try to put lots of different sensors, try to get information uh, in real time, try to have pre-analysis or even post-analysis or any kind of real-time analysis to identify where is the inflow, where is outflow, and what's happening now, and what we can do for the next to make very good early warning or very good uh, disaster monitoring things. And also uh, in Taiwan, there are lots of different kind of company provide a very, very good uh, technique as the uh, AR or VR or using the LiDAR or using the uh, point cloud information to identify lots of different, different kind of things. Oh, I'm sorry, can we go back to the... I'm sorry for the uh, point point. Uh, no, not this one. Yeah. Page, uh, okay, next. 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 Okay, so uh, like this is, uh, can you, yeah, this, yeah. This is one of example like in Taichung uh, city government the city government will be able just to sit in front of the uh, panel and will be able to catch all information directly uh, by the camera, by all the analysis. So, uh, so there is several different kind of camera from different departments, department of fire, department of police, and also department of hydrology. So all the information will be able to catch if there's a traffic jam, if there's any kind of floods, if there's something happen uh, inside the city. And they will be able to, to get uh, everything uh, just, just, just quickly, like on the panel directory, and also using the AR or VR technology, using the cell phone, we'll be able to identify where are the sewage pipeline, just uh, on the roadside and everything. So we'll be able to use all this kind of technology. Can you, yeah, look at this one. So I'll show a very short video. Hi, this is GIS so Research Center. This is Jai something uh, we've been doing together uh, with the international Tyler organization called Open Geo Special Consortium. Uh, can we make it a little faster? Yeah, just, so we work together yeah, with the Sun Water Conservation Bureau and, uh, and also the university. And so through the international uh, organization, we'll be able to use this kind of future sensors platform and use an international standard. So we'll be able to catch all different kinds of sensors information and also to analyze and also to identify, uh, combine, join together, integrate with all the models together. So using this kind of technology, we'll be able to get a lot of information. For example, we'll be able to catch uh, these are real something happened. And these are to get some kind of early alert using the cell phone te uh, technique. 
So using all this kind of te uh, uh, technology and using very, very update, uh, up-to-date uh, information, we'll be able to analyze and we'll be able to make very, very good early warning prediction and everything. So these are some of the things we've been working together with the university, with the governmental uh, organization and also international organization. Uh, for example, this is one example. We've been put uh, one of the slope land uh, monitoring sensors in one of the uh, rural places in Vietnam. So we have very successfully uh, worked on the Vietnam and guide the local company to install their uh, slope land disaster prevention uh, monitoring station and been working very well. And this is uh, one of the exhibition we've been working together in Philippines. Uh, two years ago with several different uh, private company and governmental agencies. So uh, as my information, I would like to share, uh, if we have the open sharing communication, we can work together with the industry, acad academy and government together toward a better uh, 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 disaster prevention uh, technology uh, for, for good early warning and also good monitoring. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhou. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. So I think that concludes our uh, two speakers from Taiwan uh, addressing on particularly on natural disasters and how we could manage them in a, in a better format. Now for our third speaker, we are extremely honored and delighted to have invited Dr. Rafaelita M. Aldaba, who is the Undersecretary of the Philippine Department of Trade and Industry. My deepest apologies if I pronounced your uh, name incorrectly. I, I try my best. Um, <laughs> so uh, Dr. Albada, Aldaba, she fulfills a very important key role in the formulation and implementation of the Inclusion Innovation Industrial Strategy, which is also known as the I3S which puts innovation at the heart of the country's new industrial policy. Yusek Aldama is also a member of the Board of Governors of the Philippine Board of Investments, uh, the country's primary industry development arm and lead investment promotion agency. Uh, so, Madam, thank you so much. Um, we are delighted to, to hear your presentations and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me just share... Uh share my, my screen, okay. Can you see my, 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 my slide? Okay. Can you see my slide? Are my slides visible? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Good after and good afternoon, uh, everyone. It is uh, a great pleasure to join the Philippine, Philippines Taiwan webinar, and I'm grateful to Innovex and the Taipei Computer Association for partnering with the Philippine Trade and Investment Center and the Manila Economic and Cultural Office to promote innovation and collaboration between Philippines and Taiwan. This is both timely and relevant, especially in the light of uh, the pandemic. In this brief uh, presentation, I would highlight, uh, based of course on our recent experience and as we move forward, the need for us to be innovators, to stay connected, to pursue digital transformation, and the need for uh, collaboration with other countries. Now, we were in the process of implementing our new industrial policy, which we call Inclusive Innovation Industrial Strategy, when COVID-19 hit us. This new strategy focuses on innovation and aims to grow globally competitive and innovative industries by embracing Industry 4.0 technologies to create new products, services, and processes, close gaps in our domestic supply chain, deepen our participation in global value chain, as well as uh, promote human resource development, improve our ease of doing business, along with SME and startup development. Now, there, there are two very important legislations to promote innovation and uh, startups in the country. The first one is the Philippine Innovation Act, which will um, establish a national innovation council, as well as create an innovation fund amounting to 1 billion uh, pesos, 
along with innovation centers and business incubators. The, the, the next one, that's uh, the Innovative Startup Act, will provide financial subsidies such as tax breaks and grants for our startups, uh, startup visas, build startup eco zones, startup grant fund, and an innovative startup venture fund. Now, these two laws are uh, crucial in providing the necessary resources that are needed to promote innovation as well as to boost the growth and development of our startup ecosystem. With the Innovative Startup Act, DTI would be able to implement a startup program that would provide incubation and acceleration services, mentorship, industry matching, and development support, along with an internationalization program to expose our startups to ecosystems abroad. Now, in terms of the state of innovation, the Global Innovation Index uh, showed a significant jump in our ranking from number 73 in 2018 to number 54 in 2019. So it's uh, really a big jump. We were able to leapfrog uh, last year and hopefully we sustain that. Okay, so we are building what we call regional inclusive innovation uh, centers, which uh, would serve as platforms that would link together the different stakeholders in our innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. You have the local government units, the intellectual property offices, R&D labs, science and technology parks, accelerators, incubators, startups, MSMEs, large enterprises, along with uh, government agencies and other players. The focus is on addressing industry issues and societal problems, applying technological solutions. And currently, as you can see on the slide, we have four pilot areas, uh, one in Legazpi, in Cebu, in Cagayan de Oro, as well as in Davao, where um, ideation, design workshops, R&D engagements are happening in collaboration with other government agencies and the academe, of course, is also very much uh, involved in all of these innovation activities. In the recently published uh, 2020 Global Startup Ecosystem Report by uh, Startup Genome, Manila's ecosystem is considered to be among the top 100 emerging ecosystems in the world ranking 36 overall and with a value of uh, 1.6 billion US dollars. Total early stage funding of 102 million US dollars over the last two and a half years. The, the ecosystem, Manila startup ecosystem is still in the activation phase and we are like uh, Busan, Frankfurt and New Zealand. We're looking at fintech as uh, one of the country's uh, uh, strengths, and this accounts for almost 15% of uh, Manila's startups. Another sub sector strength is uh, e-commerce, which is growing at a rate of 26.4%. Now, uh, this, he this year has been a very challenging one. With the COVID-19 pandemic continuing to disrupt uh, economies and lives. Despite the crisis, it is amazing to see how startups are responding to the issues arising from the public health emergency by offering solutions through the creation of new products, services, and processes. And as we have seen, I'm sure this is also true in other countries, people become more innovative during crisis periods. And based on a survey done by uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers, 49% of Philippine startups explored new products and services, and more than 20% of the startups said that they experienced uh, an increase in demand for their services. So using these new technologies, startups have been providing support to government through contact tracing apps, personal and community health monitoring, chatbots along with social distancing and online marketplaces. And on the slide, you would see uh, some of our uh, um, startups, like for example, you have here RC143, and I know this is going, uh, th there's going to be a talk on uh, this contact tracing app, uh, which was developed for the Red Cross. 
There's also the DWARM AI. These are drones uh, that are used as non-contact thermal scanners at expressway uh, checkpoints. And originally, these were designed for search and rescue operations during calamities. Then there's also MedCheck. I won't elaborate because uh, there's a speaker who's going to uh, discuss this uh, thoroughly. There's uh, AI uh, knowledge manage management tool. Uh, I know Senti AI is uh, also here. And then there's DATOS, which is uh, using geographic information systems, remote sensing, AI, and data science to provide maps and other information for disaster risk uh, reduction applications. Dashboard Philippines uses Google Cloud and Google Maps uh, platforms to show relevant COVID-19 information such as checkpoints, donation centers, available shuttle services, hospitals, establishments, and other um, information. And then there's also the rapid pass system that, uh, that is facilitating vehicle inspection along uh, checkpoints through QR code uh, scanning. Um, other startups that created solutions to address supply chain and logistics uh, issues include uh, Insight CS, there's also Ziles, which is a warehouse inventory management system, Intelac, along with uh, FAME or Futuristic Aviation and Maritime uh, Enterprise, which is providing a vehicle tracking solution. Now, the last, in the last slide, uh, these are also uh, some startups that emerged during the crisis. Kumo is a social distancing um, app. And then there are also cloud-based platforms such as Cloud Eats and Mad Market and uh, Cloud Swift. So reflecting our experiences in the last five months, the, pand the pandemic has provided actually an impetus to fast track the, the adoption of new technologies such as AI, Internet of Things, robotics, e-commerce, and innovation with greater focus on resilience and sustainability. The crisis has presented new Industry 4.0 technologies that we can leverage to discover new, better, and more resilient ways of doing things. Um, new and powerful technologies will shape the high-tech, no-touch, contactless era of the future. And the uh, last point is that enterprises which have greater innovation emerged resilient and even recorded gains amid the economic slowdown. So now more than ever, we realize the importance of adopting these new technologies. These technologies have played a crucial role in keeping societies functional in times of quarantines or lockdowns. These technologies would also be needed as we restart the economy, as we build resilience and prepare for the new normal. Cooperation and collaboration between countries would be a vital step as we face the post-crisis future. And there are many opportunities for the Philippines and Taiwan to work together and collaborate in crafting innovation programs and promoting more interaction among our startup and startup enablers. And Innovex, for example, offers a great opportunity to network and engage with Taipei's uh, startups. So uh, with that, I uh, would like to end my presentation. Thank you very much. Stay on if your time allows, uh, because we have another uh, keynote speakers from the Philippines. It is Ms. Katrina Chang, the Executive Director of QBO Innovation Hub. Uh, QBO Innovation Hub is a Philippine startup platform, uh, which Katrina launched back in 2016. It is a public-private initiative geared to support and accelerate the growth of Philippine tech startup ecosystem. At QBO, uh, Katrina advises startups and leads the overall program activities collaborating closely with ecosystem partners. Uh, 
So with that, I would like to invite Katrina to, to do your presentation and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you so much for having me. I, I was quite excited to be in Taiwan again for Innovex this year. And, you know, now, <laughs> now we're here, but um, so can you see my screen? Um, okay, so I guess I'll get started. Um, my presentation today will be on the Philippine startup ecosystem and of course the innovations in the COVID-19 fight. Um, as David mentioned, I am Kat Chan from Kubo Innovation Hub. And in the next 10 minutes, I will briefly introduce our organization. I'll talk a little bit about the Philippine startup ecosystem as it was pre-COVID and also how our startups have responded to the crisis. But I'm also quite excited to hear the presentation of my colleagues later from the Philippines talking about the startups um, themselves. So. Kuba is the organization um, that I represent. It's, um, as mentioned in the introduction, a public-private initiative that was um, supported and created by the Department of Trade and Industry, the Department of Science and Technology, and from the private sector, Idea Space, and JP Morgan. Our whole goal is to create a globally competitive startup ecosystem here in the Philippines. That, um, and with that view, we support startups across stages and very different industries and I'll be telling you a little bit more about them. We actually also work with a lot of partners, not only in the government, but also with large corporations here in the Philippines. And we're also very happy to collaborate with um, international organizations and helping startups. So, you know, maybe there are some from Taiwan that are looking to access the Philippines. So basically we really try to support a more dynamic startup ecosystem in the country. In addition to that, we also lead and work with a network of incubators from all around the Philippines. Like, so, you know, in all of the major island groups, we have over 7,000 of them in the Philippines, but at least we're working with 12 incubators, largely based in universities. We also have three core actions. The first is to grow the startup ecosystem. The second is to develop and support our startups. And last but not the least is to collaborate again with the ecosystem. So, and our whole vision is Filipino startups changing the world. So now that I've introduced Kuba a little bit, um, I'll move on to like the Philippine startup ecosystem to introduce it to our audience. Um, yeah, so maybe you've heard about the Philippines as being number one for fun. Um, and I guess in, our, in terms of our startup ecosystem though, we're number 53, which is not quite number one, but there are lots of reasons to be excited about it too. It's a fast growing ecosystem. Currently, we have around the country under a thousand startups, so between 700 and a thousand startups. And there are a few stats there, um, you know, including quite a number, a growing number of incubators and accelerators, as well as co working spaces. And as shared by the previous speaker, Undersecretary Aldaba, you know, increasing up support both from the government and from educational centers in really promoting and supporting our tech startup ecosystem. Some of the reasons why the, I find the Philippine startup ecosystem is quite exciting is first, um, there is a very large local market, over 100 million population, very young demographics, similar to Taiwan. Um, you know, English speaking, lots of talent, if you're, which is really the big, the fuel, right, of um, any startup is talent and relatively low costs. And again, maybe more fun in the Philippines. Some of the strengths have already been mentioned also, but I'll go through them again and again. Good value for money and maybe not the largest ecosystem in the region yet, but you know, the, in, among all growth indices, right, um, definitely one of the fastest growing. Connectedness is another one. Um, I think we're friendly and sort of easy to work with um, generally. So lots of opportunities to collaborate between startups here and in Taiwan. I hope. Um, some of the biggest industries among startups in the Philippines, right? So uh, roughly half cater to sort of the services and B2B, which has traditionally been a strength of the Philippines. And among the sort of consumer facing startups, right? We're looking at e-commerce, FinTech, marketing, media and advertising, as well as ed tech as like some of the fastest growing sectors. Um, this is echoed in several reports, again, with a, with a large population that's young and, you know, go, transitioning to digital, you're easily seeing, you know, of course, e-commerce and media, but as well as the financial services and the logistics that can make that happen. Travel was another huge one, but um, I think that's one of the hardest hit with the pandemic. Um, 
of course, um, you know, the English speaking aspect of the Philippines also does contribute interestingly to how um, our startup ecosystem has developed. There have been a few challenges, of course. Um, funding is probably the biggest one that's been identified. Um, and, you know, it's still that when there's still a huge opportunity to fill that funding gap, but the, you know, towards the end of 2019, we have started to see that turn around with some significant funding um, rounds, in particular, again, in e-commerce as well as um, fintech companies. So that brings us to 2020 and COVID-19. You know, our survey with Pricewaterhouse revealed that, you know, for at, at least half of the startups, obviously this is, um, you know, really reduced, right, the demand for a lot of services. But on the, on the other side, right, we have seen that our startups have adapted very quickly with also half in, in very quickly introducing new products and services to the market. Um, and I would say even a fifth of our startups um, have seen an exponential growth in demand in a very short amount of time. Um, at Kubo, we launched um, Rescue, which is startups versus, startups versus COVID-19, exactly to look at these two areas, right? So startups that have pivoted their businesses and have had to rethink how they approach things and giving them support for that, as well as you know, startups that have been that are creating solutions directly, you know, help in the fight against COVID-19. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, and these startups, right, range from agriculture and food security and the supply chain, right, all the way to, you know, how, you know, you sign documents, enforce contracts, pay your taxes, right, in crisis mode. Um, and, you know, funny enough, this, for, this concept actually was first launched, you know, as a thought exercise almost um, with the UNDP at Slingshot at an event that was pioneered by the DTI a few years ago. And now we've seen that it's really become a reality. The need for this has increased. Bus businesses and individuals have, you know, the, the rate at which um, technology and digital adoption has really accelerated. So... We are continuing to support a number of startups across these sectors, right? Um, and we have seen a few stories, like uh, quite a, uh, quite a few, right? And you'll hear from some of them today of how um, startups are being involved in this fight, including you know with contact tracing, with testing, with delivery of services, supply chain, even you know how the tourism industry was going to pivot, right? In in these times, so. And on the screen now are some of the startups that are working, we are working with. But I want to say that, you know, at the heart of the Filipino startup ecosystem is really, you know, solving real world problems, inclusive innovations that, you know, address challenges that we all face, right? So there are lots of places in the world that look like Manila, that look like Taipei more so than a suburb in Palo Alto, right? And we are going to be building the solutions that can help us address these challenges. Um, in various sectors and startups now are really changing lives and, you know, enabling us to continue to thrive even in these most challenging times. So I guess my call to action is really to support startups. You know, I somehow envy uh, your situation in Taiwan and maybe how technology there has enabled you to, you know, resume some normalcy, I guess. And I, I do see a huge role that startups have to play um, in this global fight, right? And in making lives better in not just bouncing back, but even creating better um, structures and um, ways of living that can stay with us even after this crisis. So with that, um, you know, I, I'd like to thank you again for having me here. I'm. I'm, you know, I continue to be optimistic about um, what the future holds and with, you know, our collaboration, what we can achieve together in building technology and, um, and yeah, and maybe try, you know, not, you know, being number one for fun. I think our area is number two in dis for disasters, according to some study, right? But maybe through tech, right? And through startups, through innovation and collaboration. Um, will also be known and be number one for the solutions that we build together today. So thank you so much and thank you for having me. Um, yeah, well, I, th I think today we've seen uh, two different 
approaches on, on the topic. So we have, uh, from the Taiwan side, we, I think we address mainly on natural disasters, uh, floods, typhoons, or uh, factories, disasters. And from the Philippine side, you have addressed uh, different innovations on, on, especially on the topic recently, uh, COVID-19, which uh, had a tremendous effect on, on our daily lives uh, and caused a lot of lives as well. Uh, so I thank you so much for that from, from, from both Taiwan and the Philippines. We now have roughly about 10 to 15 minutes for QA. Um, I will have a look now at our comment section. Uh, there, there are some questions here. Okay, so uh, Jamar has asked if we can uh, receive materials uh, that have been presented today. We will certainly ask our speakers uh, if they're able to provide a download version and we'll, we'll put that uh, a little bit later at our comment section as well through YouTube and our social platform. So please have a look out for that. Okay, so somebody has been muted by Katrina. Okay. Uh, we don't actually have any questions on, on, on Zoom. Uh, does, does any of our speakers have any questions to each other? I'm gonna throw this one at Katrina. Well, I mean, I know we're not supposed to ask off-topic questions, but for the first um, speaker, you spoke about the, I have observed that there were no um, strong typhoons yet, and it's already kind of more than part way through typhoon season. So is this a phenomenon that you expect will continue? And I guess, how do we see that affecting kind of long-term patterns, right? And you know, technology requirements, given that the climate change has been so drastic. Thank you. So this is a question to Dr. Guo. Um, th this is about the, uh, I, I think it's a, uh, surely we can easily say it's uh, climate change, but during this COVID-19 pandemic, we thought about, we see everything change, but actually, what I see is most drastic is the uh, the monsoon trough, where usually you have a strong westerly, the west wind coming to associate with the monsoon trough, but this year, this is missing. So in a way, it's a blessing maybe for Taiwan or Philippines so far, we do not have strong typhoon, but we know that this is unprecedented and it associated with the uh, maybe from the major storm over China. It's a very, uh, it's a disaster there. So there's a lot of things we are looking at the climate. We, we know the climate is changing, but the variability and their extreme is something we, we still need to understand more. So I, I wouldn't say if this year we happen again, but for, for me, most interesting is that this, this year, this climate, this is unprecedented. And uh, I, I'm sure a lot of climate scientists uh, or we meteorology will look into this and we want to know what will be better. But so far, I think it's blessing is that there's no major typhoon to <laughs> Philippines and to Taiwan at this moment, even we are already in the middle of the August. Katrina, did, did that answer your question? Yes, and actually I, a quick follow up to that. How quick in Taiwan, how quickly are you able to see sort of your research translated into commercial products or, you know, how, how seamless is the transition between, you know, what you're learning from the science to, you know, your startups being able to kind of develop solutions on, on the basis of research? You, this maybe, I'm not sure who to address it in the panel, but I'm very curious how that works in Taiwan, actually. Yeah, this is... This is an area actually, I think in, uh, in National Taiwan University, what we are doing, um, we, we surely we're doing the research. We try to maybe publishing some journal paper, but I think at the time we are a disaster center, what we are doing is that the, we try to uh, link or bridge 
from the very pure academic side to the community side. So this is exactly what my CEO he just presented. One of the important thing is the uh, in our center we are doing the community service is that we go down to each individual community, we serve and we presenting and we 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 doing uh, adapt to what's a local need and all these kind of things. You want to say a little bit more about this community? Yeah, um, most of the time uh, when we got the data from maybe from the uh, weather bureau. Uh, they got the uh, information, but not suitable for the local people. I mean, uh, when uh, we have disaster, sometimes flooding or sometimes the free flow, uh, most of the time uh, the location is very uh, like in the mountain area or some remote area. So we need to, need to do is to reduce the, I mean, the area we can focus. Um, sometimes we got a, a data, I mean, data, of course, the big data or the rainfall forecasting or flooding forecasting. But the problem is how can we uh, make very precise and accurate to the local uh, uh, community? Maybe the, the size of a, a small village or maybe that's a small downtown. So uh, we need to provide a more accurate data for them. So that's kind of uh, technology. And we also need uh, a lot of sensors to monitor the the uh, disaster like uh, uh, flooding, you have uh, inundation depths or area. So that's, uh, uh, we are working down. Okay, with, with that particular question, I think uh, you actually addressed a project uh, that our department is actually handling at the moment. Uh, it's regarding how to commercialize academic research uh, projects. So uh, Katrina, I think I'll, I'll come back to you on that one. Uh, in our next conversation to follow up. Uh, we have some questions online um, through, through Zoom, so I'll just read them out. The first question is uh, to, to the speakers here in Taiwan. What are the challenges you encountered when creating initiatives that requires expertise and sign off from different stakeholders, academic, private industry, government? Okay, so, wow, I think <laughs> this, this, is a, this is a question for uh, Dr. Zhou, I think. Okay, I think this is a very uh, big question, a very good one. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, uh, government provide lots of uh, funding support for university researchers. And also, uh, university researchers work very close with some of the, uh, we say, private company or different, but Taiwan is quite famous uh, for its uh, small and medium size of the uh, enterprise. And lots of different kind of company can produce very, very good sensors. And just like uh, Professor Guo and Lai also, also talk about in Taiwan, there are several very good private uh, climate uh, analysis company now are booming up. And also there are lots of company, they can analyze uh, lots of different kinds of sensors data using the artificial intelligence to identify lots of things. And also lots of company provide very, very good sensors. Like uh, in the next session, several uh, from several uh, uh, representatives from Taiwan uh, business or companies, they will present some of their very, very good sensors that are very good technology uh, have been worked together with uh, government, with university and can, can identify lots of things. I think in the next session, there are several very good company are going to present. So I think Taiwan uh, is work very well for government work together with, with university researchers and also with a private company. And this is also one of the good things for even for the uh, Ministry of Education is try their best to promote it, the kind of collaboration and collaboration between this kind of different stakeholders because uh, you cannot just depend on researchers. You cannot just depend on the policymakers. You cannot just depend on the private company. You have to work together with them. So that's the very important things. Yeah. Thank you. And our next question, uh, we, we actually quite have quite a few questions for, for, for the Taiwan side. Uh, we, we'll go one more question for Taiwan. Actually, I have a question for uh, Yusek Aldaba or maybe Katrina could answer this. Uh, but for now, for this particular question, 
Anski has, or oh, Oscar has asked, may I know which disaster, earthquake, flood, typhoon, etc., is the hardest to monitor or detect, and how did you solve such? Uh, this, this is a question for all the speakers here, here in Taiwan. I, I don't know which professors uh, would like to tackle this particular question. The, well, to monitor is uh, surely, it's very, very important. It's for post analysis or even for the forecast. But to, for Taiwan, the worst uh, typhoon disaster, I would say it's about the 2009 Typhoon Morocco. That's the uh, most, and uh, it's the uh, most devastating, uh, in a way, wipe out the whole villages. And uh, even politically, we lose a uh, prime minister. He has to resign for responsible for, even it's not actually his responsibility. I think he did a very good job, but still, the it's devastating. It's losing life. And uh, so the problem is that the in this kind of disaster, it's just often that we often feel it's unprecedented. So just like COVID-19 and this year climate, and I think in Taiwan, Morocco, it's unprecedented. <laughs> so it, so it's it's really the something for the academic has to learn hard to understand what's going on and try to learn from this and the bridge into the the disaster mitigation uh, procedures and all this kind of thing, and maybe even private sector and to collaborate and to 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 meet these kind of challenges. And uh, in the climate change, I think this is unfortunately probably the situation we have to meet. This this is unprecedented, but we just have to learn and we just have to collaborate to meet the challenge. Thank you. Uh, this is indeed a very tough question to answer. I think it's. Uh, all these different disasters and diseases are difficult to pr predict and prevent. Uh, and perhaps one of the key points is how, how fast and how quickly we react uh, to such a uh, tragedy. Uh, perhaps that, that is uh, one of the questions to ask as well. Now, uh, to, to the Philippine side, uh, I have a question to ask because, um, as, as you know, we organize Innovex. And so uh, we have lots of questions on. Uh, startups, perhaps uh, in, in this faculty, uh, uh, asking for funding. Katrina mentioned this uh, or, uh, in your presentation uh, on, on investment. Could you, could you maybe share a little bit on the atmosphere from the Philippine side? Uh, should we have different startups from not, maybe not only from Taiwan, but from different countries uh, coming into Philippines? How what is the uh, general feeling of investors or potential investors and maybe resources from the government uh, towards uh, uh, facilitating startups? Um, from the private sector side, I want to say um, funding isn't the biggest strength of the Philippines. I think I also shared that in my presentation and um, in the region, in the ASEAN region, I think the, the, the hub for um, especially venture capital investment would probably be Singapore. Um, that being said, um, I think invest in among the investors, right? There is still an appetite for exploring is not just um, solutions to the current pandemic, but you know, really exploring technologies that will continue to grow and have an impact even on the other side of this crisis, right? So, you know, as you, you've probably heard this before, but a lot of the huge companies that we know today, right, were born during a crisis period, right? Like the, the Airbnbs and Ubers of the world, right? Um, so in the same vein, like it's very likely, I mean, we can't see it yet since we're still in the middle of it, but it's very likely that um, a lot of changes will happen in how everyone lives, right? And that, you know, people will be adopting a lot of new solutions and that creates an opportunity and a space, right, for, um, for people to make a huge return and grow new companies from this crisis. So, um, so yeah, I think there are, still there's still definitely investors that are looking for, you know, making these bets, right, in these um, new technologies that are emerging, especially ones that are, you know, 
showing how they're able to adapt and even in a way take advantage right of the new set of circumstances that are that we find ourselves in but um maybe i'll turn it over to isak fita for um, the government's perspective on this uh, just a quick feedback uh for for cats is that i think we share similar um circumstances i think the investors here in Taiwan are also somewhat conservative. Uh, so we rely on uh, resources from the government sector uh, to, mm. to sort of get the ball rolling. Um, so I think that's, uh, we, share, we share common circumstances at the moment. It's, it's really uh, the, the government can be a catalyst, right, to inspire confidence and also kind of take that first risk, I think, which is, quite common in more conservative cultures. Um, so I agree with you, yes, that observation. Thank you. You think I'll up, perhaps? Yeah, uh, like to yeah. Discuss? Yeah, maybe just to uh, add to the discussion uh, as well. Um, in the presentation earlier, uh, I also emphasized the legislation of uh, two very important um, laws and it's actually in these two laws that would uh, provide uh, the resources that we can use in order to develop uh, our uh, startup ecosystem provide uh, support to uh, um, enable them to grow and develop we uh, of course very much recognize uh, this uh, funding issue and hence the focus really is towards uh, providing more resources creating more programs that uh, would support uh, the different startups based on their level of development. So there would be uh, seed funds, there would be um, also matching grants to be provided and uh, more acceleration and uh, incubation uh, services as well. Um, along with uh, bringing our startups abroad, connecting them um, so as to expand their network. So we have this uh, uh, planned internationalization programs, which unfortunately we were not able to carry out this year because of uh, the crisis. But uh, right now what we do, uh, um, our uh, online uh, activities such as what we're having right now, and uh, uh, we, I think we're able to generate a lot of interest as well um last month we just uh, or uh yeah two months uh in in the last uh, few months we had uh, several events with uh, switzerland as well as with other countries uh, in order to promote uh, our startups and at the same time we do a lot of uh, promotions as well we are actually um at this point creating as well an invest uh, startup investment plan and uh, that, that, that this plan uh, would have our strategy so as to promote our, um, in our startups abroad as well as to attract uh, startups from other countries, startup enablers, venture the VCs and uh, other investors to uh, come uh, to the country. Of course, right now, as you said, uh, is not, is, 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 well, of course, they're still not, uh, so many investors are interested, but that's the reason why we are preparing uh, once things uh, would normalize. And at the same time, of course, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, really very good startups who are really coming up with uh, really very useful uh, products. And at the same time, um, our strategy is also linked with uh, the digital transformation direction of the Philippines where, of course, we would need uh, a lot of uh, really very good startups that would make use uh, and adapt and embrace all these uh, new technologies arising from uh, Industry 4.0. Thank you so much for that input, uh, Yusika Naba. And, and certainly, I think, um, I think con concluding what you mentioned, uh, I think perhaps Philippines and both Taiwan is, is although somewhat conservative in, in, uh, with, with venture capitalists, uh, but I think we show great potential in facilitating uh, different startups uh, is through the private sectors as well as from the government sector. So thank you so much for that. And I think uh, with your team here in Taipei, uh, mm -hmm. under the leadership of uh, uh, Director Michael, I'm sure we have plenty more collaborations in the future to engage uh, different startups from both sides. Thank you so much for that. So I think 
uh, with, with the uh, time constraint that we have, we will uh, conclude our Q&A for now, and we'll continue uh, with our different uh, seven-minute presentations by different startups and companies from both Philippines and Taiwan. Um, so thank you so much for that. We'll just uh, change quickly change the scene here. If I may ask our speakers from Taiwan to kindly return to your seat. And then we'll start with our first uh, company from the Philippine side. It's Mr. Earl Lawrence Kwa, the director of uh, VOP Tech. Boxster, yes, thanks. Hi, good afternoon. So, Thank you uh, so me, uh, much uh, for yes. coming to our webinar this afternoon. Uh, we yeah. know that your, your topic today is inclusive innovation in a time of pandemic. And so we're yes. looking forward to that. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So can you see my screen? Yeah. So you can see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, thank you to the uh, organizers, uh, especially MECO, IDB, and uh, the Taipei Computer Association uh, for putting this thing together uh, and for the invitation for, for us to participate. So I'll um, start with the intro of uh, Voxby, and uh, this, that's, that will start with our name. Uh, Voxby is a, the lat is a play on the Latin phrase uh, Vox Populi, meaning the voice of the people. And so that's, that really is you know, our, our, our existential uh, identity. Um, so part of the original group of Voxby were the founders of uh, Chica, uh, Tita Bustamante, and Dennis uh, Mendiola, which, were, which was acquired by Smart. So Voxby Tech is the next iteration of Chica uh, after Smart, uh, with the additional of uh, a few people, such as uh, myself, who joined the fold. And so my background um, is, is in semiconductors and electronics. Uh, prior to me joining the team, I worked with uh, Tito and Dennis in, in projects uh, uh, when they were at SMART uh, in the dawn of the IoT era. And so we found ourselves to be uh, kindred spirits. And so a brief history of um, the, guy, the team and, and Vox Tech, um, you know, we, we walk our talk. Uh, the challenges within uh, emerging markets uh, to, to Vox B is a feature, not a bug. That a lot of uh, tech solutions available are really meant to solve first world problems and that Voxby has decided to focus on opportunities to develop product specifically to alleviate problems of the emerging market. Uh, after all, majority of the world's population uh, still live in uh, emerging markets. And so that's our internal mandate to make inclusive innovation uh, and that has driven our product philosophy since our early days. So, um, one of the uh, earliest products that uh, came up, came about with the team was back in the 2000s, um, in the era before Facebook, uh, iMessage, Viber, or WhatsApp. At that point, already over 10% of the Philippine population was living somewhere else uh, as overseas foreign workers. Uh, and so what uh, Chica did was develop the, the Chica Messenger, uh, which allowed email messages to be sent, uh, to be sent as email message and to be received as SMS test message. So this became the default uh, mode of communication for countless overseas workers uh, to their families uh, during that era. Um, another innovation was um, the share load. And so it was conceptualized and launched uh, by the group with uh, Globe uh, Telecommunications, one of the two uh, major telecoms in the Philippines. And so share load is, is a peer-to-peer -peer airtime credit uh, transfer uh, solution. It's now ubiquitous in the Philippines. Um, and so that service went from product launch to a, to a revenue of $10 million a month for Globe in just four months with very limited uh, marketing expense. And so uh, another solution, uh, which is more uh, uh, pressing on the Red Cross was uh, the, uh, the 143 Life Messenger. So what it, you know, the Philippines uh, like Taiwan experiences uh, multiple uh, category three, four, five uh, typhoons. And so we routinely get our entire power and, and communication infrastructures ripped apart uh, by these typhoons. So what the Life Messenger app did uh, and does uh, allows first responders of Red Cross uh, to create ad hoc uh, uh, mesh networks using Bluetooth and, and cell phones so that they can establish uh, a network where they can communicate with each other with no infrastructure after it was uh, destroyed. And so, Another solution uh, which uh, we're currently working on is uh, what we call the AI uh, solution and platform. 
So it, what it is, is a, it's a portable eye scanner uh, uh, where we uh, take pictures of the retina and we can screen uh, for diseases like macular degeneration, hypertensive, retinopathy, and you know, other general health conditions like hypertension, diabetes, sickle cell, and melanoma. So the idea is that um, we can help the underserved. In a country where you, the ratio between people and doctor is 13,000 to one, um, there are so many people who are out of reach um, by the healthcare system. And so our vision for this is to drive uh, um, healthcare uh, screening to the very edge of society. And so now in the time of COVID, uh, we definitely responded. Uh, so we developed the uh, RC143 app and we built it with the idea of test, trace and isolate strategy. Uh, a, a significant phase of the infectious period of COVID is asymptomatic. Um, with limited access to PCR testing, uh, it's truly invisible. There's, there's no way. Uh, so um, in the absence of vaccine and, and testing, uh, contact tracing is, is there to fill the gap. Uh, being already affiliated with the Philippine Red Cross, uh, which currently does about 25% of all uh, PCR tests in the country today, uh, we were in a unique and are in a unique position to create uh, the contract tracing solution that's really compelling. Uh, having said that, we are agnostic and, and work with different test labs. Um, the RC143 uses Bluetooth to track contextual uh, interactions with other users uh, within the uh, RC143 ecosystem. Uh, we, can we can estimate how long and how far apart the people were uh, during contact. Uh, this makes a world of difference to understand the context of interactions, like let's say when you're seated in a table adjacent to a person uh, or a table of a person uh, who is positive uh, versus someone you just walk across uh, in a park. Uh, so that makes a whole, uh, you know, uh, different implications of potential uh, infectiousness. Um, we provide a risk meter, uh, which is only triggered when a person is uh, tested positive. Uh, and um, green means that uh, you're safe. Yellow means uh, you have indirectly, uh, have indirect contact with a person who was positive. Orange means you have been in contact with a person who is positive. Uh, red means you're positive. Uh, so, um, you know, and we have solved uh, a lot of the technical roadblocks, such as the interoperability issues between iOS and Android phones, um, you know, based on our experience with the Live Messenger uh, app uh, earlier on. And that's why we were able to release the uh, RC143 app as early as mid-March last year, uh, this year, this year. So apart from the contextual uh, contact tracing, uh, we also have a telemed chat portal that can be routed either to the Red Cross or local government units or HR clinics of enterprises. Uh, this can be used for scheduling tests, uh, reporting uh, of symptoms directly or uh, access to first responders. It's also a heat map. So just like ways where you can avoid traffic uh, with the RC143 app, you can avoid infectious hotspots. So the next phase uh, is to go beyond the smartphone, to become much, much more inclusive. Uh, we have developed ubiquitous, uh, ubi a ubiquitous uh, contact tracing scanner, which will allow us to track and scan anonymously any Bluetooth device, such as wearables, Fitbits, uh, Mi Bands, uh, feature phones or 2G phones, and any other Bluetooth enabled device. Uh, with the scanner, we are enabling BYOD, bring your own device. Uh, the tracking of non-smartphone devices can be done by either a smart scanner and beacon or any smartphone with the RC143 app. In effect, we are expanding the tracking capability universe uh, by an order of magnitude. So as an example for, let's say, a restaurant, no more filling up of quarantine forms, no more even scanning of QR codes, which do not even provide high fidelity information. So most importantly, it's inclusive and it's frictionless. So finally, our, our hope is that the RC143 enables us as a community to save lives, uh, to get back to our normal, more resilient lives via testing, tracing, and isolating those who are infected. Uh, as embodied in our tagline, which is, 
you know, it says my lab and tile, it means that we have a fighting chance. So um, thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Cheryl, for your presentation. Uh, you made it in just over seven minutes. So thank you so much for that, very good. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's just a kind of reminder to all our pre uh, presenters uh, shortly after is that we will show a two minutes, uh, very low uh, budget uh, sign that looks something like this and of which you would uh, be so kind to kind of conclude. And then when we show a zero minute, that means time's up. Thank you so much. So thank you so much, uh, Earl. Our next uh, Philippine company is Mr. Ralph Vincent Regala Regalado, the CEO of Senti AI, uh, who will be sharing uh, his presentation on the topic of unifying COVID-19 communications in the Philippines using AI. So thank you so much and the floor is yours. Thank you. All right. Okay, um, hi everyone, I'm Ralph. I'm the founder and CEO of Senti AI. Uh, this occasion, it's a great opportunity for us to share and talk about how we were able to use artificial intelligence to help the Department of Health here in the Philippines. So early March, we've been tapped by Google to assist the Department of Health to help them streamline their communication process. So we all know that communication is an integral component in disaster management. It helps citizens to take necessary precautions, be constantly aware, and help them adhere to protocols set by various government agencies. As citizens, we are always in search for answers when a disaster strikes, and we want to know up-to-date information. We search this information across different channels, from the web, news website, or social media. We are also aware that social media plays a critical role in information dissemination because this tool has a wider reach and information through this platform needs to be maintained so that it will deliver the right information. Communication fails if people fail to understand what you are trying to communicate. Some of the reasons might be you're using complex terminologies or words that people are not able to understand because these words are not common. The length of the information is long, which tends to, which majority of people would not definitely finish reading all of those reports. And probably the languages used are not something that is relevant or not readable to some of the audience. Considering all of these challenges, we designed a solution that acts as a brain that contains up-to-date information regarding COVID-19 crisis. This solution also allows different chat integrators to connect to the brain and use this information to disseminate to various social media channels. So the Department of Health used different technologies such as Google Drive, Google Docs, Sheets, which contains vast amount of information um, regarding COVID-19. And we help transform this into readable bite-sized information and convert them into a question and answer pairs. We then build a knowledge base system to house this information. And we also capture new questions commonly asked by citizens and match them with the corresponding answers provided by the Department of Health. Through this process, we were able to build a unified information protocol that speed up information collection and validation. We then used artificial intelligence technology and we trained the AI technology using the question and answer pairs from the knowledge base. And the machine itself is trained to answer to various inquiries related to COVID-19. We, we then provide an interface channel for our uh, verified chat assistant partners who are using this um, knowledge base so that they can gain access to this knowledge base system. And through this, we were able to assure the citizens and assure also the Department of Health that information disseminated are coming from one single source of truth. Since we prioritize releasing the system early due to the urgent need, we first prioritize building the system to answer simple um, questions. Then we progress to iterative releases to answer complex inquiries. 
So we know that AI engines continuously improve um, over time as more and more data are consumed. So to speed up the data collection process in a limited amount of time, we ask help from our volunteers to help us extract more questions coming from the public and also understand how citizens are crafting different types of question variants. We also did a thorough analysis to make sure that we increase the accuracy of the responses made by the engine. So because of this constant data collection and monitoring, our team was able to improve the accuracy of the responses of the engine. So if you're able to look at this example, at first release of the AI engine, uh, it wasn't able to answer the question correctly. After the improvements that we placed into, the next release was able to not only provide answer, but also infer that the user asking is probably an um, overseas Filipino worker. One of the unique cases that we observed during this project was um, on how Filipinos ask questions. So we observed that um, people, Filipinos treat chat assistants as if they're talking to a real person. They're not asking questions directly. They put a lot of backstory about why they're asking that question. They put a lot of like questions and context. Sometimes they do context switch. They speak about Tagalog, then English. They post along narrative messages. And we were able to adjust the system to actually improve and consider all of these variations of how Filipinos are asking questions and also consider different languages that our people that people are actually using. So through this effort, we were able to support the Department of Health in communicating relevant, comprehensible, and trusted information. The engine was able to communicate consistent information to various social media channels. It was able to provide bite-sized information and adapt to the language use. Um, the engine was able to also provide information that addressed the timely needs of our fellow citizens. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning is a powerful tool if we know how to harness its power to bring positive benefit to humanity. This echo more if we put it in the context of communication in which technology should be able to understand, comprehend, and be able to adjust on how we communicate as humans. We should always um, remember that as innovators, we should put people first because it is when we empathize with people that we can conceptualize how to build technologies that will drive impact to our society. Thank you very much for listening. I, and I hope I was able to impart um, new knowledge to everyone here. Thank you so much, Ralph, for your presentation. Thank you very much. So that was Senti AI. And for our third uh, Philippine company, we have Mr. Emil Herrera, the founder and CEO of MedCheck, who will be sharing agility in COVID. Uh, Emil, the floor is yours. You have, uh, thank you. There we go. All right. Thank you very much. Um, hi, uh, I'm uh, Emil or Emil Herrera, uh, founder and CEO of MedCheck. First, thank you to Kubo, DTI, and also um, uh, TCA for having us. Uh, so I'm happy to share uh, uh, some brief insights about uh, MedCheck, our company, and our uh, how we've, we were able to adapt uh, and contribute uh, during COVID. Uh, so we are a uh, we're in healthcare technology. Uh, we empower the entire community with technology and data. Data is actually a very core part of our, our company. Uh, so we offer now full suite telemedicine, cloud EMR, uh, digital registry, and data analytics to to physicians. Uh, primarily specialists in the Philippines. Um, before COVID, uh, our core focus is really the cloud electronic records and, and disease research and registry. So working with uh, specialists from uh, institutions, researchers to collect data uh, for the research of specific diseases, uh, namely cancer and, and diabetes. Uh, when COVID hit, uh, we, we really made a, a concerted effort to, to shift uh, due to the changing environment to help uh, not only our existing doctors, uh, but all doctors, not just the frontliners in the emergency room, but all doctors and, and patients, uh, especially the cancer patients and diabetes patients who, who we help serve, um, continue their care, uh, given the changing risks environment of going to the hospital uh, and, and the pandemic uh, quarantine that happened in Manila quite swiftly and in, in right away in March. Uh, so in addition to the EMR and the data collection uh, and disease research, uh, we added full suite telemed to, to help our doctors see their patients, the patients continue their care, but also for the doctors to continue their businesses, another important 
uh, aspect of, of the impact of the pandemic uh, on the economy, on, on everyone and their own professions and lives here in the Philippines. So uh, Cloud EMR, we already had, uh, but we very quickly, within three weeks, actually implemented our, our video videography feature. We partnered uh, with an American company called Twilio, part of one of their programs to help with COVID. Uh, so that was one. We, we were also lucky that we have a very dynamic development team uh, and our lead front end had built a, a video feature before. So we were able to get that up within a few weeks time. Um, also the electronic prescription uh, so that, you know, especially for the, the patients that our doctors continuously serve uh, who have chronic diseases uh, would be able to continue to fill their prescriptions and their treatments, uh, even remotely. Uh, very great support from the local government, uh, from the FDA, DOH, to provide the proper guidelines so that uh, all retail pharmacies could also uh, receive uh, and were willing to receive digital prescriptions as well. Uh, and then completing the circle, allowing our doctors to continue their practice uh, and, and continue their continuity of their own livelihoods as well, right? Uh, so that we partnered with, with that we partnered with uh, local payment providers, uh, pay wallets, pay Maya, Gcash, uh, and are in, in the middle of implementation with another local bank, uh, UBX. Uh, and so being able to complete that loop and also adding our patient side of it. Um, and so while we had, previously been really focused on the doctors and helping the doctors. Uh, we already, we, we sort of accelerated the rollout of our patient uh, facing uh, portal. And so first with them being able to book online, book their teleconsult online, including the full patient consent form um, as approved by DOH uh, as well. And so really completing that loop uh, so that all the physicians um, who were affected and their, and their patients uh, more importantly as well, uh, can fully continue to communicate and receive treatment uh, digitally and remotely. And so you can see here, uh, it, it really, really helped uh, being agile and implementing the different technologies and features from uh, steep drop off right during quarantine uh, to implementing our telemed and then back to uh, actually increasing now in terms of our number of users, being able to help beyond our, our original base uh, it's the entire medical community here in the Philippines. Uh, and we're happy to say as well, uh, whereas previously we were focusing uh, mostly on cancer, the study of cancer and diabetes, we're now also um, in the middle of implementing for uh, one of the major respiratory institutions and helping them collect uh, data for further research with respiratory diseases, which will also include uh, COVID as well. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Um, feel free to contact me. Emil, for your presentation. Thank you. So that was uh, our third uh, company from Philippines. So that concludes the Philippine side. Uh, we will now move on to companies from Taiwan. So our first company from Taiwan to address is Mr. Benny Yang, the head of strategy and operation officer of Rolling Star Survey Technology. And he'll be sharing ground-based synthetic aperture radar system. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm Benny Kuning Yang. Um, I'm behalf of Rolling Star Company and happy to, yeah, to share our experience to all the friends. Uh, the topic is ground based and set aperture radar system. You can uh, just say the ground based star system, look, in short. Uh, the, so the solution and device is focused on a slope monitoring. When we talk when we talk about a landslide, like in the traditional ways, uh, we use like ex extensive meters to the station, 200 meter or incline uh, meters. All these instruments are perfect for ground truth data, but however, they are labor intensive and also they require the outside operation and maintenance. Uh, that, mean, that means we have we have to let people exposure to the potential hazardous areas. And by the way, all these, all these sensors, we measure only one dimension points. 
So we have to check out uh, uh, several points and especially a wide area that's very uh, labor intensive. So uh, not, uh, uh, not, very, uh, not, not a good solution. But what is the good solutions for lens flight monitoring? Um, I think there are several uh, features for one is non-destructive non -destructive, that means we use a remote sensing strategy that will keep uh, people away from the dangers. And the second is high resolution, like we can measure so the deformation up to a millimeters uh, accuracy. And third, uh, uh, we can monitor the wide area coverage like a, a complex 3D models. As I said before, there's all the traditional ways, they only measure one point, one dimension points. But if we can measure the complex 3D models, that can let us more understand the trend of a disaster or event uh, happens. Um, most of the way, mo um, most important that we have to uh, monitoring all the uh, hazardous areas or uh, all weather seven, uh, 24 hours and seven, seven days a week, all the times. Uh, of course, the real time online reach of the early warning is very important. Of course, cost effective is very important for those methods to the monitoring the uh, lens lighting. So how, what the scenarios goes, that we can set, uh, I, I, I use the chart to say, uh, to show, show you, uh, the first uh, we use the remote sensing uh, device that to uh, monitoring of the potential uh, lens light areas. And the second is that we generate the deformation images that with the 3D models and 3D maps. Then uh, we, uh, re we reporting the result, results uh, online to the authority or the data center uh, to the, um, for the future analysis and the risk assessment in advance. Then broken test then uh, we are early warning for the evacuation and the mitigation effort. That's the scenario we operate. So how it operated that you can see the chart that there's a sensors, uh, a other sensors uh, uh, along with the trick uh, forward and backward. And we can divide the two parts. The one part is the sensors operate. And the other part is the uh, analysis part. We, we, we calculate and the analysis is a synthetic pure process technique produce a 3D deformation images. Uh, we see highly spatial temporal resolution. Uh, and how it goes, because it's, uh, we use the SAR inferometry methodologies. Uh, SAR inferometry in SAR is a technique which uses the phase information retrieval from the interaction of two direction waves to retrieve the temporal or spatial information on the wave propagation. So that you can see uh, the page that if this uh, object have a, there's a displacement of the object and a two wave uh, uh, electric, electrical wave the phase difference that we can show the different, uh, the uh, small micro dif uh, displacement of the uh, of the object, oh, and also we can use for the uh, vibration detection or the height detection. And here's a, a simple video that we show how it works. That uh, we set the uh, device in the uh, Taojin Park in the Jilong. And you can see that this, oh, sorry, there's a little bit, bit delay, but you can see that the sensors that uh, forward and backward along the track. And you can see that what we observe is the upside mountain areas. Uh, maybe we can uh, wait and uh, see the video to show the distant, distance and the environment for, for you guys.
okay uh, as an after the scanning after the scanning now we can get it we can generate a, a, a face face image map for 3d and also for the velocity and acceleration map acceleration map of the uh, wide coverage place time so uh, again so I point out some point and the solution that's remote sensing and we can um, measure we can measure the observation from long distance up to two kilometers away and and cover the wire coverages in morning and day and night and we can detect micro movement up to millimeter levels and also the slope has the error the earth that's my uh, yeah thank you everybody thank you very much benny thank you for your presentation thank you okay so that was our first one and the second company from taiwan is mr ryan wu the deputy general manager of wave gis technology and he'll be sharing the topic on flood inundation sensor and applications thank you thank you uh, it's it's be good to be here and it's my pleasure to be this webinar my name is ryan and i work for wave gis technology and in the next few minutes i would like to show you uh, the iot inundation sensor here we develop in taiwan and how we uh, use it in taiwan for the last three years and first of all uh, I would like to uh, introduce uh, where I come from. Uh, WebGIS is uh, a member of the Audix Corporation. And, okay. And this company is founded uh, in 2004. And WebGIS uh, always provide a uh, very device diverse range of the software and hardware integration here in Taiwan by connect uh, data, uh, which uh, 15 years ago, uh, we connect the GPS for fleet management. And 10 years ago, uh, we collect the uh, hydrologic, hydrologic and hydrologic data like water river uh, level or the flood uh, water level or the GPS of a pumping machine for the <coughs> disaster <coughs> response and for the emergency uh, response. And three years ago, uh, we developed our own the low power water level sensor and its data logger for the hydrological and flood uh, defense uh, application. Here is uh, the reference of our uh, customers. Uh, most, most of our customers uh, are the government, uh, including central and local government. And we provide the hydraulic observation and the flood early warning uh, hardware and software integration project uh, for central government like the Water Resource Agency or the local government, uh, including the uh, big city like a new Taipei city, or the smaller city like Keelung city, Xinzhu city. So we have uh, various customers uh, across the island and we provide uh, hardware and software uh, integration. So since uh, we all know the fraud is a global issue, but it needs uh, a local solution. And like we uh, already uh, noticed that uh, no matter how we prepare, uh, the climate change has uh, totally uh, changed uh, uh, the scale, uh, changed the expectation that we can prepare. So uh, we think that we might, uh, here in Taiwan, we have diff different uh, 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 idea about the fraud defense. Because we can uh, control the fraud, but we could try to learn to live with fraud if we have time to prepare, if we have time to collect the instant data from the field. So this IoT inundation sensor is 
designed to uh, acquire the water level sen sense data in the most uh, cost effective way. So we have two parts of this uh, water level sensor. One is the upper, upper side, uh, like you can see in the uh, right side in this page, uh, there is a, a log LP1 data logger that we provide a low power and long range a transmission uh, cooperate with our, our telecom company. So we uh, utilize the MBIOT to provide uh, the data transmission. And we also build in the Leon battery uh, to survive uh, at least one year. And of course we have several de uh, design to help the machine could uh, be robust and be uh, efficiency uh, in the outside. And the other part is the water sensor that we use the pressure sensor to measure the water le level. No, no matter is inundation or is a water level in the river or in even in the sewer underground. So the character of this product is it's really low cost and it's really low power and it's really easy to install. So you can see here in this page that the whole uh, product is even portable. That means if there is no need in this uh, sense, you can easily uh, install it uh, to the place that you need. So here is the, uh, the quantity of the uh, water uh, inundation sensor that we have already built, already installed across the item uh, for the last three years. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's over uh, 800 sites across uh, Taiwan. And we also uh, suggest that you have a several uh, convenient way to install your sensor. If it's an uh, inundation sensor, it's upper right, left in the page, or you can put it into the soil or uh, alongside the river bank. But uh, the hardware is only uh, the fundamental tool for the application. So we think that uh, this uh, sensor helps to provide the flood, we call it flood data. Flood data is basically from the very basic raw data of the water level, even although it could be in the very upstream or to the downstream, or the fresh flood uh, information. That means that uh, the, you can collect the water level or the flood impact uh, data of your own city to help your city government or your enterprise or your management office to respond uh, earlier and to, to respond more effectively. And the last, but certainly not the least, we think uh, with the flood data express and our own uh, our own uh, sensor that we could have uh, several benefits. Of course, like I say, uh, se several uh, minutes ago, we could respond the flood data more uh, quickly, and we could help to collect the real data from the field for the model of validation, and of course, the AI uh, deep learning for the future. And here is my brief, thank you. Thank you so much. Ryan, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, following that, we have Carl Lai, the development manager of Thinktron, who will be sharing his topic on data platform for smart disaster prevention. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. OK. Um, this, uh, my name is Carl Lai. I am, I'm from Thinktron. And today I want to share a topic is about uh, emergency uh, data platform, which we call the EDP for smart disaster prevention. Okay, I think like Philippines, Taiwan has lots of types of the disaster and such like the earthquake type form of the flood or the landslide. And um, unfortunately, they might come together. So we think to have using the modern technology, like ID technology to help to, uh, to have better disaster prevention process is important. 
and let's see. Uh, okay, so this is a uh, this is a very uh, simple uh, process. Like if when a typhoon comes, like uh, the old government will set up uh, with uh, the emerging operator centers, and then our team might need take one hour to do the data collection and the other data, and our team might need to do the data interpretation, and then we need to overlay those disaster data set with uh, like a, such as the populations and the household to find out like how many people that we should take care of them, and then we can provide our uh, our um, commander to have sufficient data to do the ma to make decision. Okay, so it's important to have uh, uh, the, the automated emerging data pipeline. So, for example, like when data, when the disaster comes, you need to aggregate the, the any data set you want to have. For example, from the local government, from the central government, or even on the, from the um, weather bureau or water bureau. And you should have uh, like use like uh, the core technologies to keep updating those data set, and you need to integrate them into the data storage like the database and develop a system application to use those data to help you to make the decision and speed out the process. Okay, so, and then those emerging data sets, they might be Excel or from some kind of JSON format, and then you need to um, transform them into the map, your coding on the maps. And you also, you need to, okay, and you also want to check for a certain timeline for example, for the one hour time and where, my, how many the cases have been reported by the citizen and how many cases you need to look for. Okay, and you can also filter and then to focus on certain district from the administrative boundary. For example, this is uh, the Yonghe district from the new Taipei cities. And you can see that how many cases have been reported from the citizen. And for commander what, want to make decision, now on, you need also have the, the data which been summed up. For example, this is a full time in date dashboard. And then you can understand that from now and the, these, these um, accidents or disasters uh, and because how many people got injured or disappeared and how many um, water got going to the warning level. Okay, and for commander let to understood the, the whole picture of this and you you need to also to check of detail of the cases for example, uh, this is a, a case that on the certain first row on, and then the typhoon blew down the, the traffic lights and and then you can know about the, and you can know about the full life cycle of the, how the case is being handled by different teams and you can to see the picture from the from the field okay and you can you might need to use the weather data for example this is a typhoon patch with the forecasting and this is the rainfall for the forecasting distribution and we also you need to also combine any uh, iot device such like the cctv or is the ip cam and then you want to check out that how bad it is during around the, the cases and so that you can know how uh, how many people might need your help and send out the, how many uh, resources okay and then you you need to also combine with uh, any uh, iot devices that you want to have for example this might be the rain station the water station and even is the uh, underground level sensors then but for example, this is uh, a river already reached his warning, uh, warning stages. Okay. And besides the monitoring that you might also use, need to use the historical data set and uh, to, to do the prediction. If you can do a good prediction, if, for example, for the next six hours, we might understand that there might be a flooding in the new type of cities. So you can have more time to action to doing the rescuing. Okay, so one to wrap up is that like we develop this uh, system in the EDP set from the tier one, we call it monitoring to the prediction and to the process. We want to aggregate all those data sets and let it to be 
uh, easy to be used and then can, can be used by the whole team from commander to the data aggregation team and the rescuers. They can share all those, the same data platform and then they can speed up. So they can save time and can save more life. And finally, I want to share is that when we use the EDP list solution to help New Taipei City to win the Smart City Reward in the last year. And we think the key factor is that we, you need to have the good and the solid domain knowledge. And you also need to have the good sense of the data science so you can understand the power of data. And most important, you need to have the a good uh, implementation for the IT system so that you can bring your ideas to be, become a better process. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Carl, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we have heard uh, three companies from Taiwan uh, sharing their company uh, solutions for disaster management. Uh, but now I think we, we have a very interesting presentation coming on. Uh, it's a real case study uh, by Dr. Li, who is the uh, hydrotech engineer of Thinktron. And um, she'll be sharing her topic on applications of IoT in smart flood prevention. Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, and, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Yuanhua Li, and it's my honor to uh, introduce our work today. And today's my presentation topic is application of uh, AIoT in uh, smart flood uh, prevention. So this map uh, shows the natural disaster yearbook in uh, 2019. And uh, the, the disasters, uh, the disasters uh, are extreming. So you can see, uh, including uh, there is a uh, typhoon, for, uh, forest fire, and flood, and the heat wave, and so on. And there are typhoons in uh, Taiwan and the, the Philippines. So we are facing the same problem. And now here is uh, another type of uh, disaster in Taiwan. It's a uh, rainstorm. And according to the, the Global Risk Report 2020, uh, from the top one to the top five, uh, the risks are all environmental problems. And the, the top one the risk, the top one risk uh, is uh, extreme weather. So let's see what happened in Taiwan. So uh, in the past, we faced uh, many, we fight with many uh, typhoons, and uh, usually we will have uh, at least two days to to, to uh, prepare. And uh, on, in the left hand side, you can see the this is a Sudilas typhoon in 2015. And uh, the pictures on the right hand side is uh, a rainstorm in 2018. So you can see it's a, a regional rainfall. And now we only have only a, a few hours to, to handle this problem. So the dis disaster type, type is changing and the, the response time is becomes shorter. So we need a new solution to enhance our disaster prevention time. So we apply AIoT to reduce the uh, response time. So here is a framework of uh, AIoT. Uh, there are three layers. The uh, first layer is uh, perception layers. Uh, we collect uh, the dynamic and the static data, such as the rainfall, water level, and the flood inundation sensors, and the flood defense materials. We collect all uh, useful data for the disaster prevention so we can make the uh, right decisions. And the second layer is a uh, network layers. It's a uh, new generation uh, communication technology. It's uh, low power, uh, low power cons consumption and, and low cost. So we can uh, widely set up the sensors so we can collect uh, more data for this, this, uh, for, to make uh, decisions. And uh, the third layer is application layers. We construct a river a smart river management systems. And these systems uh, provides uh, real-time data, the AI water level forecast, uh, and uh, a CAF, uh, active uh, early warning, and uh, the disaster prevention resource. So this uh, uh, information will provide the river management office to, to make uh, decisions. So now let me show the, the application of the smart river management systems. 
uh, there are three periods of uh, before disaster, during the disaster, and uh, after the disaster. So before the disaster, we will check the, the typhoon past waves and, uh, and also the rainfall forecast and the OAI forecast for, of uh, water level and the flood simulation. So if the, the forecast tell us the future will become worse, so we have to do some action earlier. And during the disaster, we will check the real-time rainfall and the water levels. And if the water, the rainfall or the water level is over the threshold, the light bulb will uh, give a message to uh, do the active warnings. So when the engineers, they get the information, they will ch check the CCTV monitors or the flood inundation sensors. So they will confirm the situations and uh, they will check the, the nearest near uh, disaster prevention resource such as the pumping machines or the flood, uh, in flood defense uh, materials. So they can uh, uh, distribute this uh, resource. And after the, the disaster, we will collect the hotspot uh, records and uh, we can prevent the next uh, damage is coming. So uh, here is a short uh, videos to show to uh, display this uh, system. So you can check the AI forecast uh, water level and also you can uh, check the real time rainfall and the water level. So the engineers, they don't need to spend too much time to visit a deep, uh, uh, different uh, website and get, they can get all the information from this website. And this is uh, uh, the water level in from the upstream to the downstream. So you can check the situation in whole river basin. And this is the CCTV monitors. You can check the image. And the next is the flood in, um, in foundations. So finally, this, uh, this system provides a one-stop integrated uh, service. So the next is the live bot. The live bot uh, is a uh, uh, communication software and uh, usually uh, every Taiwanese people have use it. So the engineer, if they go outside and they can use a smartphone to check the information. They can check the rainfall, the water level and the flood inundation sensor and the cultural observations. And in this page, you can see uh, the light will send a message to into the uh, the, the this group and so when the engineers they get this message they will uh, start their work in advance so the, now the information change from the passive to active so next is the ai what water level forecast uh, comparing with the traditional hydrological uh, modeling uh, ai model can uh, predict the water level quickly and uh, now the rainfall and the water level for the, for the past six hours are used as uh, input to generate the future water level for the next six hours. So this, uh, this, this uh, methods help us to enhance the water disaster prevention efficiency so we can achieve the smart, smart uh, flood preventions. And uh, this is my presentation. Thanks for your listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Uh, Dr. Lee, if you remain uh, with us, and I will also invite some of the, the startup company here in Taiwan to, to come in front. So we have concluded uh, six uh, different presentations plus one case study uh, regarding disaster prevention. We have maybe five, maximum 10 minutes for some Q&A. Uh, so I don't know if I'm gonna check on on our Zoom to see if we have any Q&A uh, regarding the startups. Okay, so I'm gonna start with Oscar here. So Oscar asked, uh, says, we have a problem also with sensors. Most of them are, are available in Taiwan. Is there any way that we can bridge this problem? Okay, Oscar, I think I, I need your help here to whom this question is addressed to. Or do we have a, uh, any, any companies there that would like to perhaps address that? 
Unfortunately, we don't know to whom the question is for. So the question is, we have a problem also with sensors. Okay, so something about the sensors. Most of them are available in Taiwan. Is there any way that we can bridge this problem? Is this a logistic question? Thank Director Michael, thank you so much. If, hi, um, if you ste step into the camera, please. Thank yes, you. Hi. <laughs> so, um, yes, I think if this company is from the Philippines, I think they're trying to source a technology that is available in Taiwan. My office is here. We will assist you. Uh, just give us the details. Email us at taipei at dti.gov.ph. And uh, David, before I go ahead and ask a few questions, I think I'll try to ask uh, some of my own first and try to connect. So you see uh, the technology is being presented by the Philippines and uh, from uh, Taiwan reflect the realities of both uh, countries. For example, we're in the Philippines where we are still battling COVID in a big way, the technologies that are being presented are used to fight COVID. But here in Taiwan, because you don't have a transmission for more than three months now, and which is very viable, um, you are actually addressing real world problems such as natural disasters and you are professors, uh, your, I would like to say that your technologies are really, really uh, perfect for the Philippine setting. And I, I would like to work with you. Uh, I hope to bring your technologies to and find new markets or partners or both in the Philippines because I think it can save lives and save the economy as well. Because even after COVID, we will still have this annual rotation of calamities in Philippines. We have flooding. Yesterday we had a big earthquake. We have landslides and star storm surges and, and the strongest uh, typhoon that hit landfall uh, hit us in my hometown uh, several years ago. So, so I think this is my job to connect you and uh, well thank you very much. It's not really a question but uh, more like bridging the gap between the two. Thank you so much, Director Michael. If you please stay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, to, to your feedback on that is that vice versa, we would love to work with the office and also Katrina uh, and also uh, any parties involved that would like to bridge uh, Philippine companies or startups into Taiwan. I think we have different resources available to assist, to scale up or to connect with some of our ICT uh, companies uh, between Innovex and Computex. I think this is one of the uh, very good platform uh, to, to bridge that as well. And obviously across industries is, is something that we, we work with uh, many, many times nowadays. I, I Yes. Uh, and maybe I can share my experience, right? Our company, Xinchuan, we help um, the, the other company in the place. We help them to ship uh, some sensors such like the river, River stage level sensors and then the flooding sensors. But I think the, the most uh, difficult problem is not the shipping, but it's the you need to apply to the local laws. For example, the device when you ship to the your country, they need to follow the local, uh, for example, uh, electronic device exam law. Then and in when this is done, then you need you need to have the team that can do in the maintenance for all the devices because the devices. They are normally in a critical or the extreme uh, situation, so it's very hard to maintain. So it's it's not easy to re rely on the the, the maintaining which is outside of the, of, the con of your country. So let's, I think this question is very it's not an easy question, but I think we in Qingchuan or we in Taiwan can willing to help. Thank you. I think you addressed the point where uh, Director Michael's office perhaps can help. So. Uh, I think anything to relate to that uh, should be addressed to the office and, and hopefully we can get connected. Now, Katrina, thank you so much uh, for your question. I, this is a very good question. So this is from Katrina. So she says, sounds like Taiwan startups are largely focused on IoT. How do we get these devices deployed in the Philippines? Also noted, the Philippines ones are software based. Is there demand for software focused solutions like the ones presented in Taiwan as well. Any collapse that makes sense? Katrina, I think, I think this is a, a call out for a project in the future. <laughs> um, uh, if I may, just quickly, uh, one area of cooperation that I see is 
is the the strengths of the F Philippines in IT and uh, uh, BPO and localization of the technologies that you have. So they apply um, rights whack in the Philippines. Uh, so if you bring a product or a solution to a certain market, there's certain levels of localization and adaptation to the market, like language, for example, and culture. So maybe the Philippines can play a role in, and help you uh, bring your products worldwide. Uh, this is what we do for other uh, products and solutions anyway. Certainly, uh, uh, to feedback on that, I think it is traditionally well known that companies from Taiwan are very focused at uh, hardware devices. Now we are coming into more solution-based as well, but localization is definitely uh, a very key point here. Uh, so like mm -hmm. Director Michael and Katrina has mentioned that uh, for companies from Taiwan uh, moving into different markets, localization with the local companies in terms of perhaps software, it could be a very good, uh, interesting point to, to take on. We, we have, um, okay, so Oscar is coming back to us. Hi, Oscar. So uh, Oscar says, we are looking for Accelograph for our earthquake monitoring, and most of the Accelographs are in Taiwan. Okay. Something about earthquake. I, I do apologize. I'm not an expert in, um, in this particular field. Uh, is this addressed to a particular company here in Taiwan, or is this a general call out for accelerographs? Oscar? Uh, well, we do know some uh, excellent uh, uh, company in Taiwan who might uh, provide this kind of product. And since we all know the director Michael today, so we know uh, who we could contact. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. And luckily, we have director Michael here today. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for that question, Oscar. Uh, I think it brings us to a lot of business opportunities. So. Um, Due to the limitation of time, I, unfortunately, I'm going to have to conclude today's session on uh, disaster prevention. Uh, I think we've had a very fruitful event today. Uh, both experts from Taiwan from, from the Philippines have shared their thoughts and knowledge and practices. Uh, I think we have also uh, started perhaps a collaboration uh, possibility in the future. So thank you so much once again uh, for our guest speakers from from Philippines and thank you so much for everyone here in Taiwan who actually came to, to the office at TCA. Uh, thank you so much. Stay tuned with us at InnoVex channel and of, of course Taipei Computer Association and hopefully uh, we will bring you more exciting content in the near future. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you.